Hey, it's Dr. Gonzo, and you're listening and tuned in to Talking Points. Thanks for joining. Um, last time uh, that we did a podcast for uh, Talking Points, I had a chance of interviewing two good friends of mine, and, and I decided that because they were so good as to describing uh, aortic valve stenosis, they're also uh, recognized experts in the management of aortic valve stenosis. I figured I'd reach out to Sukesh and Anita Kruger, uh, to uh, to talk about how to manage aortic valve stenosis. And so with me are, uh, again, my two good friends, Sukesh, Sukesh Virgin Roba and Anita Kruger. Thanks for joining, guys. Thanks for having us, Dr. So uh, before we jump in into the topic, I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, the first one is, uh, how are you guys doing with the COVID-19? Everybody good at home? Sukesh? Yeah, it's uh, certainly... A game changer, life changing, and uh, you know, importantly, it's given me more time to spend with the kids a little bit. So it's given me a little bit more perspective on what they do, distance learning from the school. So getting involved a lot more in the homework and see what mom does at home, you know. So, uh, Anita, how about you? How's uh, how's the COVID nineteen nineteen thing sort of affected you guys? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> as from a surgery standpoint, obviously, it's been a little bit of a, a confusing thing trying to figure out you know timing of surgery around things but you know we're, we're working through it and home wise everybody's good so i don't have any complaints are you having any problems or anything like that what's that nobody having any problems everybody at home healthy everybody's good it was doing good are they missing sushi sam oh my gosh yes sushi <laughs> sam is so good we're missing that for sure south like do you eat sushi I do, yeah. Okay, so if you're ever visiting us in South Lake, Anita, we got to take him to Sushi, sushi Sam so he can have uh, the best sushi. 100%, right. yes. Yes, right. absolutely. Okay, you know, a lot of this changed since last time we, uh, we did the interview. Uh, yeah, we did the interview, uh, the first podcast with you guys about two weeks ago. And that was at the, at the beginning of what COVID-19 and the COVID pandemic uh, has done uh, to the nation. And certainly a lot of things have changed in a very short period of time as to how do we manage patients. And I think the most dramatic thing uh, that has changed is our interaction with patients, giving all these policies and suggestions and guidelines that are coming from the CDC, as well as from our own hospitals and our own hospital groups uh, as to how to best to do it. And while we have right now a great medium uh, like zoom uh us and i'm not we're not paid by zoom us just for, we just use it because it's actually easy uh but it certainly has changed the way that we manage patients and so you know um before we dive in into aortic valve stenosis and what we wanted to talk about how let me ask you both because i'm really interested in getting your 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 point of view on this how, how's it changed to catch your management of patients uh in the office you know it's uh a significant uh, paradigm change, I would say, which a lot of, I think, things which we would adapt moving forward as well, because a lot of patients coming in after testing and stuff like that, we've made it a point now to do telephonic visits on them. So the telemedicine seems to be working out pretty good in certain spectrum of patients. Obviously, you can't put a stethoscope on the patient, but for follow-ups, uh, where it's routine, discussing results, uh, discussing... Uh, kind of a routine follow-up, I think those things work out pretty good with telemedicine. So I think that is going to be something which is uh, adaptable and might change the way in which we look at things from a practice perspective. And, um, you know, I, I think that's here, to change. that's here to stay, in my opinion. Anita, how about you? You know, as a, as a heart surgeon, I know we, they joke around that if we ever carry a stethoscope around our necks, um, really not operating, but, uh, but we do use it to set the scope uh, once in a while. But how does it change uh, in the management of, of patients today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Sukesh. I mean, it's been, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised at how well it goes with these uh, virtual visits with video. I think, you know, my ability to at least explain a procedure to a patient and answer questions, it, it's a great medium for that. And I actually, I had an elderly lady that I talked to the other day. She wanted her son to hear what well, we just conferenced him in. And so he was at home and it all, it all worked out really well. 
the only thing is that being a valve specialist, like I am, I, I love, I, I mean, that the, the stethoscope exam is so huge for what I do and I have missed that. Um, I mean, does it really change things altogether? Maybe not, but I just, it's something that I'm so used to using as part of my, my overall approach to the patient and my decision making. So I do miss that a little bit, but you know, overall, I, I agree, this is gonna be a big part of where we're going in the future because it's worked out so well. Okay, well, let's jump in into sort of the, the purpose of the podcast, which is discussing the management of aortic valve stenosis. And just like everything in technology, I think that uh, we're in medicine. Technology has evolved to such a degree um, uh, as to how we used to uh, manage aortic valve stenosis, and now how do we manage aortic valve stenosis? So, you know, from a surgical perspective, Anita, uh, why don't you tell the public what is it that we used to do? Uh, for aortic valve stenosis? Well, not only what we used to do, but what we still do a lot of the time, and that's to basically open up the chest, open up the heart, um, take out that diseased valve, and then put a new valve in its place. And so um, not to say that there's not a role for that anymore. There still certainly is. There's, And we can talk about the, the reasons why you might decide to go that way for a patient, because I mean, yeah, if somebody were to say to me, like, why would I have surgery when I can not have surgery to treat this? That's a, that's a really good question. And so there's, there's a role for it, but yeah, I mean, it's, but it's, it's not, it's not a, a cakewalk. You know, we do, it does involve going to the, going to the operating room, going all the way to sleep, general anesthesia, having your chest open and all that kind of stuff. So we can kind of talk about the details of that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Okay. So um, about, I'd say about eight, 10 years ago, we started looking at utilizing catheter-based technology to treat aortic valve stenosis. And, and definitely uh, the percutaneous replacement of the aortic valve has been an incredible disruptor. And I, and I use disruptor in a positive way in this particular case. Um, how, how's, it, how's it changed? Tell me a little bit about the evolution of how things actually got to where we are today. You know, uh, looking historically, Gonzo, I think Alain Cribier, 2002, when he first started those experiments and those almost uh, patients and extremists were not candidates for surg surgery at all, I think that started the whole ball rolling because, you know, I, as you know, it, it was realized just ballooning the valve was not an option at all. It, it, it really was not doing much for patients because they used to reach to nose. But I do think that uh, with uh, evolution and uh, with the kind of the rigorous way in which this was done, I think uh, really starting off with those cohort of patients who were extreme risk, which basically was that 100 patients you operate, 15 patients or more die, and the uh, high risk, which was between 8 and 15 of those 100 patients die uh, when you do open surgery, I think that really laid the foundation out uh, of which patient subsets would potentially benefit. And I think that was a good runway and sedgeway to uh, transition into where we are now. And like with anything else, like you said, it's a disruptor. And I think in a good way because technology has certainly helped us um, with getting into those catheters, more compact, smaller in size, better valves. Uh, and, uh, and then we've gone down the train of the, uh, the Society of Th uh, Thoracic Surgery risk scores, which basically is those with uh, intermediate risk, which, is those, which who are those who have a mortality between 3 and 8%. And uh, again, demonstrated an equivalence of the technology with uh, TAVR with surgical aortic valve replacement. And I agree with both of you and work closely with you guys. And we, it's not one size fits all. You individualize it and make those decisions in these patients. But then finally, I think the paradigm shift has been in those low risk patients where surgery has been kind of the mainstay for these patients. Excellent outcomes with both of you really exemplifying what work you guys put in. Um, you, know, you have outstanding outcomes and less than 3% mortality in those. But even in those patient populations, I think uh, with the latest data which we have, which have come out over the past couple of years, uh, there is a role for TAVR in the appropriately selected patients. And uh, I think individualizing it uh, has made it really easy for us to have optimal outcomes in these patients. But that's been the evolution of TAVR. So, so Anita, what, so tell me, what, what do you tell patients? Because you know, we have gone now to treat them, you know, uh, 
not preferentially, but I will say that there has been a very good push by several in the community to try that as a first line of therapy, just like we did stents, okay? When, when coronary artery disease, um, you know, was treated, it was initially treated with bypass surgery, then stents came along, okay? And, and we did this whole dance in which everybody needed to get stents. But, but we actually committed some mistakes. Our societies made some mistakes because we went, this, the pendulum swung too far to one side and people were getting stented left and right. That's what then led later on the American College of Cardiology Institute guidelines and specific risks of who benefits from stents and who benefits from from heart surgery or bypass surgery. I feel as a operating surgeon, and I'm not a percutaneous surgeon, I am a operating surgeon, that some days it feels like the pendulum has swung too far to the, oh, well, everybody has to get TAVR. And I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's actually right. Um, what, so what's your take on, on what's going on uh, and how patients are coming to you? Are they, are they asking that they want to have TAVR or, or are they wanting to, well, what, you know, whatever you tell me, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay with. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's a really good question. I think, you know, my role is a little bit unique because I also, you know, obviously I do open surgery and I do percutaneous surgery. I did, you know, that extra year of training so that I could kind of really learn the full spectrum from what to do with people who aren't quite ready for anything to people may, who are like too sick to have anything done and everything in between. So I feel like, you know, to some extent, just like with a lot of the stuff that we get as surgeons, you know, patients, patients are very educated now. They, they've come not only with the information that's been given to them by their cardiologist or maybe even their primary care doctor, but they've, they've gone online, they've done some research, they, if we, you know, they, they do a Google search and they've, and they've found all kinds of information. So when patients, I feel like by the time people come to me, um, you know, they, they're armed with a lot of really good information, sometimes some information that's not as good. Um, but in general, a lot of people are going to ask for the most minimally invasive thing. And I don't think that that's bad by any means. I mean, if it was my grandmother or something, like, I wouldn't necessarily want her to have a big giant thing if she didn't have to. So I think, you know, patients do want the most minimally invasive approach a lot of times, and there's not anything wrong with that. Um, it's just kind of, it's, 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 a, it's great for some patients and some patients it's not really a good fit for. And so that's what I really focus on when I have a conversation is, listen, I don't have any, you know, a, a dog in the fight for one procedure or another. I can do all of it. So let's talk about what the risks and benefits of each potential approach would be. And that's kind of how I approach it. Sorry, I had to unmute, unmute myself. Um, so Sukesh, tell me, tell me, what are you seeing out there in the community when a PCP refers you a, a patient that has a murmur, and they or may they may know that they have symptomatic aortic valve stenosis? What are they asking? Are they asking, hey, uh, tap? I want him tabbered, or are they saying they're letting uh, you decide, or or are they saying are they knowledgeable enough that they understand now that there's a valve team? Um, that basically manages these patients? Uh, yeah, a bit of all of the above, Gonzo. I think a lot of times, most of these folks, as we know, are octa nonagenarians. And when they get to that age, the decision-making in those, I think, is uh, uh, simple because majority of them, you know, either they have had prior bypass or uh, just are frail, and they fit within the mold of someone who, you know, would be a taver in majority of the cases, as long as anatomically, and we can talk about some of those uh, anatomical stuff with coronary heights, et cetera, where they would not be a candidate for taver. So th that bucket of patients, maybe even up over 75 in my books, if uh, they have any of those frailty issues, et cetera, would fit right into taver. Now, the interesting question Anita did bring up, I mean, you know, the Tavar valves, the, we not looked at their longevity, which I think is one of the things which uh, over a period of time, those questions are going to get answered. What is the uh, durability of these valves? Do they last you 10 years? Is it 15 years? Or hey, they begin to fall off at year eight. We've not seen a signal of that up to year eight now for which follow-ups we've had, but time will tell. I think that is one of the most important missing questions right now when you have discussions with patients. 
Um, but as I just said, like with anything else, even with surgery, open cholecystectomy versus laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you guys have pioneered some of the technologies where everything's gone minimally invasive. But as a cardiologist, at the end of the day, I think you want to make right decisions for the patient because it may be that sometimes a mechanical valve in some of these patients who, you know, you, you've got some of these valves like Onyx where, you know, I, I know we've talked about that and the question of running the INR a little bit lower in these patients may be one permanent fix for these patients. Say they're 65 was in their early 60s, that might be a one-time fix for them for the rest of their lives. So, you know, I, I think a lot of this is individualized. As Anita said, the patients are really educated. They have done their homework. They've been online. Uh, Watson has been referred to on a regular basis, as is Google. So they come in informed with, uh, with very educated kids and uh, who are very concerned about uh, grandmom and granddad. So I think, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, though, I think it, just having surgical colleagues like you make it really easy because we give the full 360 for the patients so that they can get different options, get different perspectives, understand the advantages of each. And uh, I think that's what makes this rewarding in one way. But, uh, you know, but each patient's different. Some of them are dogmatic in what they want. And some are, you know, like with, like with the whole population, I guess. Some are more reasonable. They understand the nuances and want to make the best decision possible. And they understand we're looking out for them. Okay, so Anita, when, when somebody comes in to see you for, to be evaluated for aortic valve stenosis and, um, and, and you, you, know, you get the referral, What's the process? Tell me, talk, walk me through the process that a patient goes through when they're going to get evaluated for aortic valve stenosis at our center. Sure. So most of the time, um, just kind of depending on how or which, let's let's say this, like let's say, are they getting referred from a cardiologist who does the procedure or not? And so that kind of drives things a little bit because let's say that Dr. Virgin Ropa refers a patient to me. I know that he's already dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, he's gotten the correct imaging, he's, you know, the, the echo is going to have all the numbers that we're looking for, all that kind of thing. Um, and so they might be a little bit further along in the process of getting their, their pre-procedure workup than if a cardiologist who doesn't necessarily do TAVR refers the patient to me. So um, it kind of can vary a little bit just depending on how far they've gotten in the workup process before they come to me. But either way, what I do is, as, as I look at, I look at the echo images themselves and confirm, you know, that we do indeed have the criteria met for severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, and then I look at any other available imaging that we have. I look at the EKG, um, and then obviously I sit and talk to the patient about anything else that's going on with them, any of their other medical problems, and. If, you know, so what I will tell them, if they haven't had all of their complete TAVR imaging, which involves a big time CAT scan with contrast of the heart, the chest, the abdomen and pelvis, is I'll go through, you know, if I see any red flags, you know, without that study, then we'll kind of talk about that. But if not, then they kind of go forward after that and get some more imaging, they get some lung function testing done. And I make sure to tell them that we have to get all the results of everything together and discuss it in our heart team conference, which we have every other week, so that all of the implanting cardiologists and the implanting surgeons have a chance to review everything as a group, and that's when the final decision gets made. So I just make sure to tell them, here's what I know about you so far. Here are the risks and benefits of you know, going which whatever, with whichever approach you know, we go with. And the final decision about the TAVR will be made uh, when we have uh, our, our meeting after all the workup is complete. And so um, I think they leave my office with a pretty good understanding of kind of where things are going in that regard. So, so I guess if, if, uh, if the patient comes in from a non-procedural cardiologist, say from out of town, like we have a good proportion of patients that do so, do they see you guys at the same time? Do they see you guys separately? How does that work out? It depends. Like I said, it's just, it's so variable sometimes. I mean, I'm happy to see a patient directly coming to me um, and we can, we can start there. Um, sometimes they get referred directly to our valve clinic at the hospital, in which case they go and they kind of start getting their work up done like those CAT scans that I mentioned. 
And I've, uh, the Valve Clinic knows that they can call me and let me know whatever day that's going to be. And I'll just go in and evaluate the patient there in the hospital on the day that they come in for their studies. And then usually um, uh, Dr. Virgin Ropa or another implanting cardiologist is also available to do that. And if not, then we just make sure that we set up an appointment in that cardiologist's office as well um, so that, you know, everybody gets a chance to see and evaluate the patient. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So, uh, Sukesh, now giving our current environment, do you think there's a role for doing all of the visits instead of into separate um, separate uh, visits to a different cardiology in a different office? Is there value in in uh, doing it now through uh, telemedicine, and then you guys seeing the patient at the same time when you have all the studies and all the tests? No, I think it's huge. Um, you know, you absolutely hit the nail on the head because, you know, uh, some of the things, Gonzo, is it helps to put your stethoscope, but a lot of times the echo has already been done. So you already know what you're dealing with, what the numbers are. Then it comes down to the logistics of uh, what the patient prefers, what the options are, and what are our next steps. So I think this telemedicine kind of, uh, you know, pigeonholes into what exactly our pathway is. So it makes it a lot easier from a patient and family perspective that they don't have to travel this whole distance, especially in this COVID environment, so that uh, they can stay safe, importantly. Because as we know, with cardiac disease, the COVID mortality is pretty high. So I think this prevents one unnecessary additional um, you know, exposure for them. Well, and I, and I just think that the way that we're moving forward, why not, right? As Anita pointed out at the beginning of the show, why not? just add another person into the mix and then why have a meeting an additional meeting if you could have you know somebody who basically can see it from afar and you just hand them over this this video and they can review it and they everybody can share it and not, I shouldn't say share it because we would have it in a protected environment but at least that people could see as part of the chart uh, because we were I, I feel some days that we're still in the in the old days in which we looked at hieroglyphics or sort of wall paintings and kind of interpreted what we're trying to say because charting and, and the message is not delivered as clearly by a picture or a video, right? That we're seeing the patient. Um, I, I, I honestly, I don't see why we shouldn't, you know, valve clinic sets up a virtual visit. Everybody shows up with the patient. We review the charts ahead of time and then, you know, we can make a decision like that. Uh, and then it's recorded, and hey, it's there for posterity to sort of use and, and to study. Okay, well, you know, having, having so the patient gets evaluated by you guys, and it goes to a committee. Um, the committee is almost like, like the heart transplant committee. I mean, the, the purpose and the spirit of it is that it gets pretty lively, okay, because there are people who are supporting the decision, all right, and I've been there. Um, I've stopped going because some days I just let my emotions get the best of me and I'll admit to that. But, but, but it's really good because there's a really good back and forth about what's going on and you discuss it. And then, and then it's almost, they're, they're looking, I shouldn't say for reasons not to do it. They just want to make sure that it's the right thing to do. Tell me, uh, Anita, how, how, how those meetings conducted? How, how does it, how does it go? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's it can be a pretty lively discussion. Um, as I said before, there are cardiologists at the table, there are surgeons at the table. We also have um, nurse practitioners and an echocardiographer who kind of helps us look at the imaging, and we have nurses, and so there's there's it's a big team and. Rightfully so. Like you said, we want to make sure that we're being. I mean, the the bottom line is we want to make sure that we're being safe and that we're going to do a procedure that is going to benefit the patient because everything that we do has risk, right? Even though this is something that's not as invasive as a big open heart surgery, this, there's, there are risks involved. And so if, if I'm going to expose a patient to the risk of anything, I want to make sure that I feel that I'm going to benefit them. And so to sometimes, you know, it's, it's, you know, we, we get to know patients and I'm like, man, I really want this to happen for this patient. And you kind of lose sight of some of the small details that like, well, maybe that's something that we need to look out for. And so it's really nice to have another set of eyes to look at things. Um, but there's, there's a, a, a cardiologist who runs the meeting at our institution and he kind of helps to keep people on, on track 
Um, and yeah, we just, we discuss every case. We, we look at the imaging, we, we look at the history and, and we decide as a team whether or not we think it's the right thing to go, to go forward and, and do, and what procedurally do we need to make sure to look out for and all that kind of stuff. So it works out pretty well. That's great. Sukesh, I'm going to put you on the spot now, okay? Uh, because I know that you know the answer to part of the question, okay? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot. Um, tell me three common situations that you have seen, okay, in which a patient is not, not a tavern candidate. So and I think uh, that's, that's a great question, Gonzo, because, uh, you know, patients have four valves and uh, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, say the mitral valve is involved, you have a pretty significant leak, a degenerated valve, or it's really stenosed, uh, bad, uh, and say the tricuspid valve, which is the valve between your right upper and lower chamber, say that's leaking a lot. Um, and the patient uh, kind of is having a lot of pitting field edema and stuff like that. So multivalvular disease, when they have that, obviously that would be the first uh, situation where I would say, hey, listen, I, I don't think this is the right thing to do. It probably is better off in your hands where you guys go in and you know either do a double valve replacement or do a valve replacement and a repair and put a ring around the tricuspid or whatever it is, I, I think that'll be appropriate. But sometimes it does happen that even in those patients, they have a hostile mediastinum or have a portially aorta or something like that, which would preclude surgery. So, but I think that would be one of the first things which I would say if they have multivalvular disease, they're better served with surgery. The second thing I would say is, you know, as Anita said, we are pretty meticulous with the way in which we work up these patients with the CT. So we look at the coronary heights. I think a uh, low coronary height, anything less than 10 millimeters, um, you know, especially when the sinuses are ephased, meaning that they're not really broad, they're very narrow sinuses where the coronary arteries come off. Those patients have a particular risk of potentially ending up with coronary artery obstruction. So, and those are the second set of patients, I would say one has to be really, really careful with and need to make sure that they're really not surgical candidates at all before we press forward and uh, kind of, uh, you know, just try to put a valve in. The other subset of patients, as you love to do, Gonzo, with your all your commando procedure and everything like that, I would say is your uh, ones where you have aortic aneurysms and uh, say you're doing a root reconstruction or something like that. So anyone who's got, you know, any kind of ascending aortic aneurysms or... Um, uh, such, or typically a bicuspid valve where they have their aerotopathies, um, I think those are the other candidates where uh, obviously a tower would be suboptimal in those patients because you're not treating the underlying potential progressive um, uh, kind of aortic, ascending aortic dilatation and uh, adverse outcomes with that. So I think those are kind of the top three on my list, I would say. I would say, hey guys, listen, I don't think this would be a surgical candidate. I mean, it wouldn't be a tower candidate, but would definitely be ideally served with surgery. So, okay, Anita. So let's assume that somebody is not a tower candidate and uh, is a oper a good operative candidate. Okay, um, what's what's usually uh, and tell me what the length of the procedure is, and postoperatively, what could be. Uh, regularly expected of their recovery in the hospital after surgery and then long, you know, postoperatively at home. So you're talking about open aortic valve replacement? Yes. Yeah. So um, if that procedure, if we're just doing a aortic valve replacement by itself, it's probably on the order of one of the shortest uh, patient, uh, I'm sorry, surgeries that we do. Um, I mean, the, the amount of time that the heart has to be stopped so that we can open it and take the valve out and put a new valve in is usually less than an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say the, the overall surgery time is you know, less than two hours or so, and then add some time, obviously, for kind of going to sleep, getting lines placed, all that stuff. Um, everybody goes to the ICU after that, um, and most patients are off the ventilator the same day. And then the next day, they're starting the process of getting up, moving around, um, eating, drinking, all that kind of stuff. I would say the average length of stay in the hospital is anywhere from four to seven days. 
usually on the shorter end of that for a straightforward case. Um, and then beyond that, it, there's a little bit of nuance depending on the overall approach uh, that is taken for the surgery. If we do what's called a full sternotomy, meaning dividing the breastbone down the middle, you need a total of six to eight weeks for that bone to completely heal. Um, and so during that time, patients are pretty functional. They're getting up and walking around. They're making their self, themselves a sandwich. They're taking a shower, all that good stuff. Um, but they're not doing anything that really stresses that chest wall. So any, any big time pushing, pulling, the biggest pain in the butt that, that people don't like is that I, I don't, I tell them that I don't want them driving during that period of time. Not so much because the motion is, is dangerous, but because if that airbag were to deploy um, in the event of a car accident and hit that sternum that hasn't healed, that could be pretty dangerous. So that's kind of the instruction that I give people. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I won't lie. It takes several weeks to really get back to where you where you're feeling good. It's it's uh it's a little bit of a tough. It's a it's a tougher recovery than a transcatheter valve. Yeah, and and I'll add to that that in a in a good candidate that maybe isn't part of the working force um, and they want to get back to working. I I usually tell them, you know, on average for the range is usually three to five weeks, which I see them going back to work especially if they're on the healthy side and they already were working ahead of time. Um, you know, the, 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 I've seen it, you know, on average on a month, they usually take off and then they, they go back to work and usually light duty at the beginning, depending on the type of work that they do, you can increase that or decrease that. But the sternum usually will be much more stable at about three months after surgery. Um, if, if you do that, so okay, same question for you. Um, what do you tell patients? What's the, the process of the TAVR? How long is it? And then after the TAVR, what's the, the hospital course, if there's any, uh, after the TAVR? And then when, you know, when can they go back to regular activities and when can they go back to work in contrast to what Anita uh, presented with uh, an open approach? So, no, great question, uh, Gonzo. I think uh, creating expectations for the patient and family, even before the procedure, I think is extremely important. So when they walk into my office now, when I tell them about the procedure, I tell them, be mentally prepared to go home the next day. So that is the, I think, most important thing because people think, yeah, you're placing the aortic valve, you expect to spend three to five days in the hospital, which I think the mindset and the way in which we approach this has uh, changed, especially with the so-called minimalist TAVR, which we do now, uh, whereby we're using conscious sedation, we're using percutaneous closure devices in the groin, avoiding any incisions, and then uh, kind of doing the whole procedure with the patient, uh, you know, a conscious uh, sedation, so literally, and uh, not even under deep sedation. So I think it's been a paradigm shift in the way in which we treat this patients. Um, Obviously, as Anita would agree, I think some of these patients are not optimal candidates for that. Sometimes the comorbidities would preclude them from safely doing conscious sedation. But I think the uh, majority of these patients, about 60, 70 percent of them would be optimal candidates for conscious sedation. And that's been shown to have a more rapid recovery and uh, early discharge. So our protocols on these patients have evolved, I would say, in the Five years I've been, five, six years I've been doing this, I think uh, we've gone from length of stay about three and a half, four days to about next day discharge in about 70, 80% of the patients across the board. So, which has been a paradigm shift. So, but I think the most important thing is creating that expectation with the family that they understand that the patient's going to go home the next day. And uh, once you kind of reinforce that, they realize, yeah, they're coming in sick, we fix the valve, and they're going home. Now, a few things which are important, I think, which uh, depending on the type of valve you select, well, one of the big issues which comes up is the pacemaker. I think uh, that is uh, certainly might change the length of stay on these patients because um, particularly with the self-expanding valves, there certainly is a higher risk of a pacemaker implantation. Kind of in, in our hands, it's probably close to 10%, I would say 10 to 12%. Whereas with the balloon expandable valve, I would say it's about 6%. Uh, 
but there's still a lot of nuances. Uh, you know, it's an 80 year old with uh, already having conduction system disease. So that's the other expectation when we meet these patients, we tell them, hey, your risk is high for a pacemaker. So be prepared to have that, which would mean an additional day they might have to stay in the hospital so they're not surprised. So I think um, from, from a tower perspective, we've gone, I would say, a minimalist approach, conscious sedation, percutaneous access and closure, and uh, early discharge. But then you nuance it with the patients, letting them know, hey, these are the potential risks in you particularly because these are the changes on your EKG. You do have some conduction system problems. This might preclude an early discharge because it may be safer to watch you another day. Uh, and then you may or may not end up with a pacemaker. So I think uh, that would pretty much what I in general go with them. But obviously there are risks. The risks I think in our hands now are less than 1% for stroke and death. Uh, so that's getting better and better. Um, in certain situations, we can also put a device in the uh, carotid vasculature, the so-called sentinel device, whereby to prevent strokes and in certain situations that is, that is as well available. So, uh, but again, bottom line, I think when I tell these patients, that's the expectation we create. Next day discharge a majority of it. Okay. Well, well said. Okay, guys. Well, closing comments. Um, uh, Anita, what do you want to tell the public about Tavers? You know, something that it's important for them to remember about this particular discussion that we had today. Um, I mean, so full disclosure, I love TAVR and I love doing TAVR. I, I also love open surgery. So I think my, my, my take home message a lot of times for patients, because they may not have something that says like, you are clearly a better candidate for surgery or clearly a better candidate for TAVR. Several patients are going to kind of fall into, you know, this, this gray zone where they might be served, you know, well with either one. And so I think you know, uh, TAVR is a relatively new technology. We're getting more and more data, you know, with it, with every passing day. But when it comes to people who are younger, so early 60s, you know, certainly any younger than that, I don't feel that I have enough information about these valves to know, and, and Sukesh talked about this a little bit earlier, how long they're going to last. We do have that data for surgical valves. And we can, we have the ability, we know, to go in later and put a TAVR inside of a surgical valve, the valve and valve TAVR. So it's just something to think about, again, for the, for the people that fall into the younger cohort. I mean, if you're 85, chances are the TAVR is going to get you where you need to go if you're otherwise a good TAVR candidate. Um, but, you know, for somebody who's got potentially another 30, 40 years to live, we're not quite sure yet. And so... The data looks good so far, but a lot of the data that we have is on the shorter term. So I just make sure that everyone really understands that. Okay, that's good. I, uh, Sukesh, how about you closing comments for the folks listening? No, I think Gonzo, both of you have been a big asset, at least for the community here in Fort Worth. I think, uh, you know, from a surgical perspective, you've given us uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of a boost, if you will, uh, for taking on really complex cases and being able to offer the people here in Fort, not just in Fort Worth, but also with the outreach clinics, which you guys are doing, which has been a great partnership to have and uh, to provide those patients who did not have that kind of care available to them. But I think from a TAVR perspective, I would say that uh, individualizing the decision-making, kind of have the team approach to it and making uh, patient-centered decisions, me and Anita always talk about this, not just whether it's TAVR or SAVR, but even in TAVR, what kind of valve do you choose in the patient? Is there a risk of having, say, patient prosthesis mismatch if you put one particular intraannular kind of valve versus a supraannular valve? Is there a risk for a high risk for pacemaker, on the other hand, in a particular patient with conduction system abnormalities? Um, kind of individualizing that, kind of making sure that you have the patient in the center of that decision making rather than one size which fits all, which is what I think at the end of the day would make us stand out as a program, which is what we strive to do. Obviously, you know, your great surgical skills along with the surgical team always uh, really helps in providing a complete 360 for the patient so that we can offer the best technology for the right patient at the right time. So, well, thank you so much. 
Okay, guys, well, we got to the end of the show. Thank you again for being part of Talking Points. Uh, as always, very insightful, and I know it's going to be very helpful for patients that are seeking information about TAVRs and open surgical repairs or replacements. Um, if you want to ask and uh, uh, reach out to Dr. Virgin Ropa or Dr. Kruger, uh, look down at the bottom in the description uh, block and you'll see their contacts right there with a telephone number that you can reach them. You can also all leave comments in the comment section underneath uh, this video and uh, we'll make sure that we pass it along to uh, Dr. Uh, Virgin Ropa and Dr. Kruger. Guys, thanks again for being part of this. Thanks for having us, Gonzo. Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Okay, well, and that's it, guys. This is uh, Dr. Gonzo uh, for Dr. Gonzo's Talking Points. Uh, stay tuned, and there should be some more interesting videos for you uh, coming up. See you, guys. All right. Cheers.